and realize that the convincing that we are going to do is basically the basics. So we are not going to deal with that deep and intense uh, convincing where you have to calculate even on percentage basis. So this is just a, uh, the basic. We are more interested in knowing and see that you know how to record transaction, you know what you do when you receive money, what you do when you make your payments, and that is where you are going to see that double entry system in play now. Because in this case, every transaction that you record, it is up to you to make sure that you record it in two accounts. So when we're doing bank reconciliation, the other one is recorded for you, then you just have to record the next one. So in this instance, you have to record all the transaction. If we say you receive money, you must receive money in your cash book, and then you must post it to your client's ledger account. That is what's going to happen when you deal with convincing. So when we talk about convincing, as I've said, some of you are already dealing with convincing in your respective practices. So when we deal with convincing, we are basically dealing with the registration and the transfer of a property. For convincing to, uh, to be there, there must be what you call a seller. In other words, somebody must be willing to sell his or a property. It can either be a land, it can either be a land and a, and a property built on that particular land. And in that instance, as soon as you sell that property, then you need the service of a conveyancer. You need the service of a convincer. Please make sure that when you assist your clients in a convincing matters, you are a convincer. You cannot take a mandate, a convincing matter, if you are not an admitted convincer. Remember, you must be admitted first as an attorney, and then you do your convincing course, not the one that you are about to do. A convincing course which you are going to do for about six months when you pass that convincing court so the course and then you can make an application through the court to say you want to be admitted as a convincer as soon as the court admit you as a convincer then you are in a position to take mandate from your client for registration of properties i've once came across one attorney so a new practicing attorney new in the profession, he got a client for uh, uh, who was selling the property and he took the mandate. And uh, what I found him doing was that he was basically drafting a contract. And uh, the contract was simply saying the seller is selling property number one to the purchaser and then putting all those terms and condition. That's not how you sell the property. So the property must be, the transfer must be done through a convincer and it also be done through the deeds office. So it's not about signing uh, that specific contract. So you need to be very careful. That's why I'm saying as long as you are not an admitted convincer, if the client says I'm selling the property, you rather refer that property to somebody that you know as a convincer. So now you've got the seller who says, I need to sell my property. Now, as soon as he says, I need to sell my property, that tells you that this person needs the service of an estate agent. Why do you need the service of an estate agent is that you as an individual, you will find in many cases that you do not have an idea or knowledge of the value of the properties around the area where you want to sell the property. You might wake up and say, you want to sell your property for three million, for instance, only to find that that property can either sell it for more than what you are selling it, or you can even, you can sell it for less. It's not going to be bought if you sell it at three million, depending on where your property is situated. So the valuation of the property depends on the location of that particular property. So a property of the same size in one place will not be valued at the same price in another place. So, but that if you leave it 
in the hands of the estate agent, they will be able to assist you to tell you, no, you want to sell this property, and a property of this size around this area, it will sell for this much. Now, as soon as you agree with the estate agent about the valuation, now you formally give the estate agent instruction to continue and market your property. And during that discussion, you and the estate agent will come to an agreement in as far as the fees of an estate agent is concerned. And as soon as you and the estate agent agrees on the fees, that tells you there is an agreement between you and the estate agent. And at that time, the purchaser is not in the picture. And that tells you that the fees of an estate agent must be paid by the seller because an agreement was entered into between the seller and the estate agent regarding the marketing of that particular. And what is important again regarding the estate agent is that the estate agent's fee are only payable upon registration of the property. The estate agent's fees are only payable upon registration of the property. Before the property is registered, the estate agent's fees are not payable. That is why in many instances when they want to pay the estate agent before the registration of the property, you will hear them using the term advance. Why do they call it advance? Because they are well aware that the estate agent's fees are not due and payable, so they're just advancing that particular estate agent. So you need to be uh, very careful there when you're dealing with the estate agent. Some bigger firms are able to pay those advances and uh, that's why you see most of the time they are able to keep their estate agent uh, uh, who gives them good work time and again because of those advances. They are able to take those risks. But as a newly established firm, you'll find that taking those risks will be too much risky for your practice because if the property is not transferred, if for whatever reason the transaction does not go through and therefore you've got a problem because you've already paid uh, that estate agent some money, uh, some commission on this property. Sorry. On this property, which is suddenly not, be, not selling. So that's why we say when you do that, you need to be careful. Now, this is what happens now. Now, the estate agent finds somebody who is interested in buying this property. And that person who is buying the property will be what we call the purchaser. Now, the purchaser now comes into picture because you will consult with the estate agent and the estate agent will sell that property as much as they can sell uh, uh, to the prospective purchaser and if the prospective purchaser is convinced, and then the estate agent will take this prospective purchaser and take him to the seller's offices. So not the seller's office, but the conveyancer's offices. And in the conveyancer's offices, they will sign the necessary documentation. In most instances, the purchaser will pay a certain deposit to the conveyancer to say, I'm giving you this deposit so that you uh, as a proof that I'm, I'm really serious about buying this property. Now, as soon as the convencer receives this deposit, the convencer receives this deposit in their trust account. And remember I said, client's money, you receive it in your trust cash book, and then you are going to credit the purchaser's trust ledger account. You ask yourself, whose money is this? This is the purchaser's money. That is why you'll credit the purchaser's trust ledger account. I'll show to you just now how you record those type of transaction. Now, as soon as you debit your trust cash book, it means you are receiving the money. And then you credit the purchaser's trust ledger account with the money that you have received from the purchaser because that will be the purchaser's money. And in many instances, after you receive this purchaser's money, the purchaser will ask you to invest the money that you have received as a deposit. And if the purchaser doesn't request you because 
In many instances, they do not know that you can invest on their behalf. Now, you as a practitioner, you need to tell your client to say, I've received a huge amount of money from you, and therefore, can you give me money to invest this money on your behalf? Remember, you have to tell this client about the advantages of investing that money on their behalf. And the advantage is that if the money is invested, it's going to earn interest on behalf of your client. But if the money remains in your trust account, the client is not going to get any interest. In other words, by the time the money is paid back to your client, it will be paid only in respect of the capital that you have received from that specific client. That's what uh, you are going to pay that client. And uh, remember the interest from the trust account again will go to your legal practice fidelity fund, but not your client. That's why it's very important that you advise your client about the investment. I've seen many cases where the attorney comes, uh, the clients comes to back and they want to sue their attorneys for not giving them the interest. Let's say, for instance, you give your clients give you uh, three million, and you keep that three million with you for five, six months, and the client expect that by the time you get that three million, there must be interest on that money. And then later on, there is no interest. Remember to switch off your camera. Now, at the end of the day, there is no interest on that money. Now, the clients then start taking you on, and they end up reporting you to the Legal Practice Council. And if you have not advised the client about the investment, and therefore you are going to be in trouble, you might find yourself having to calculate the interest in terms of the interest rate of that money for that period and pay it over to the client. Because remember, whatever the money end, while it was sitting in your trust account, that you cannot give to the client, that must go to your legal practice counsel in the form of the legal practice fidelity fund. So they are not going to compromise and say, you forgot to invest on behalf of the client, let us help you pay your client's interest. They are not going to do that. It's your own business to see how you are going to uh, make up for that mistake that you have done. So always advise your client about the investment so that you make an informed decision. And that investment that you are investing on behalf of your client with your client's instruction is an investment in terms of Section 86 sub 4 of the Legal Practice Act. The, when you invest on the instruction of your client, you are investing in terms of Section 86.4 of the Legal Practice Act. So when you invest in terms of Section 86.4 of the Legal Practice Act, you are investing on the mandate of your client. You see, we are dealing with the investment in particular on chapter 8 of your manual, starting from page 69, that is where we deal with the investment. But in short, the most investment that we would like to uh, uh, refer you is in terms of section 86.3 and 86.4. So in terms of 86.4, as I was explaining, that is when you need an instruction from your client to invest in terms of that particular section 86.4, where you are going to take your section 86.2 funds and then uh, invest it into your investment account. Now, the, the effect of this investment in terms of section 86.4 is that upon maturity of this investment, 95% of the interest will be paid to your client. And then the 5% of the interest will be paid to the Legal Practice Fidelity Fund. I want you to understand that. When you withdraw the interest or at maturity, the interest earned from this investment, 95% of the interest, not of the capital invested, only of the interest 
will go to your client and then 5% will go to the Legal Practice Fidelity Fund. And please remember that. I've had a number of attorneys coming to me and asking me to say, we see the Legal Practice Council is writing us letters and they say we must pay them the 5% interest from the investment that we have invested on behalf of our clients. How possible is that? And immediately it comes to my mind and say, oh, these are those attorneys that are practicing under the Legal Practice Act, but they have got no idea how the Legal Practice Act look like. Because you still have those people. You had people that practice when we were still using the Attorney's Act, but even today, they can't tell you what does the Attorney's Act look like. I always say, please, make sure you read this Act. This is the Act that regulates you. Read this Act, read the regulations to this Act, so that you do not fold in your practices. You do not make mistakes in your practices because everything is in the Act, everything is in the regulation. They tell you. So if, you, if they had read this act, they will, they will know that from that investment, 5% must go to the Legal Practice uh, Council. And I can tell you, if you haven't read that, and you pay your client all the interest and your clients are gone, the Legal Practice Council is going to need or to get that 5% from your business account. In other words, you must pay them from your business account. How you get that 5% interest that you gave to your client as a bonus is none of their business. So you need to make sure that you follow that step in terms of which 95% of the interest is credited to your client and 5% is credited to the Legal Practice Fidelity Fund. We also have investment in terms of Section 86 sub 3. In terms of Section 86 sub 3, you are investing the money that you are holding in trust. And then you've got no mandate to any, from anyone, but you as a legal practitioner, you decided to say, I've got enough money in my trust, what can I do with this money? Let me invest it. And when you invest that money in terms of Section 86 3, you invest without anybody's mandate but on your own initiative. And if you invest on your own initiative, we say you are investing in terms of Section 86 sub 3, and the interest from that investment, all of it, must be credited to the Legal Practice Council or the Legal Practice Fidelity Fund. All of the interest in terms of Section 86 3 must be credited to the Legal Practice Fidelity Fund. So remember you, as the attorney, you are just a custodian. You are just looking after that interest, either on behalf of your client or on behalf of the Legal Practice Council, and you do not get anything at all. The only thing that you will get is that if you uh, contribute more interest than anyone else, uh, in your section, at the end of the year, during the uh, Legal Practitioners Annual General Meeting, you will see the Legal Practice Council will be holding some presence there. And they will say, the firm that contributed most, they will give them the prizes there. I don't know how much those prizes worth. I've since uh, attended the AGM uh, it was still called the Law Society. I still attended that uh, function. I think the last time I attended was uh, in 2009. And by then, I remember I was still an attorney. So it's a long time ago. But what I know is that there are prices that they will give the best performers in terms of contribution of interest to the Legal Practice Council. So the, the harder you work and uh, keep that money in the trust and make interest, and then the better because you will receive uh, those prices at the end of the year from the Legal Practice Council. So what I was saying is all the interest in terms of Section 86.3,
must be paid over to the Legal Practice Council. And then I'll show you not long ago as what type of transactions are you going to do when you, uh, when you invest the money on behalf of your, of your clients. So I'll show you exactly how do you do uh, that type of investment. Now, when you have invested that money and now you are in the process of registration of that particular property, in many instances you will see that the attorney, more especially the conveyancer, they are able to calculate what we call the performer fees. And when they calculate the performer fees, they are able to say to the uh, purchaser, most of the time you will see the cost of registration of the property are paid by the purchaser. Now they will say to the purchaser, we have calculated your fee and this is the pro forma invoice. Can you please pay an amount of 50,000 rents into our trust account so that we can proceed with the registration of the property? Now why do, we, why do they call this a pro forma? It's a pro forma on the basis that it's not a final fee. They might register your property and in the process they run out of fees and then they can come back to you and say, please add 10,000 and more. And then you add that, they register. Or while registering that property with the 50,000 that you have given them, you might find out the full cost of registration was 35,000 and therefore you've got a change of 15,000 rands and then I can tell you the conveyancer will pay you back that 15,000 rands into your account if that money uh, is left in your uh, in your account with them at the end of the registration of the property. I always tell students to say in the in the profession the most reliable people, uh, the people that you can trust with your money, are the conveyancers. Because I can tell you the conveyancers. If you've got a change, they will give you, they will give it back to you. The conveyancer, if you've got a change, they will give it back to you. I'm not sure, quite that very much sure about uh, legal practitioners, the attorneys, but conveyancers, they will give it to you. The same thing, if there is any amount that you need to pay over and above what they have told you, and therefore, you will have to pay that, even if they have to send you a statement or an email or a letter during that time when letters were still being very much used. They will send you a letter to say, please come and pay 10 rents. Your account has got an outstanding amount of 10 rents. Then you have to go and pay that 10 rents with them, and then they can close your file. If you don't do that, remember, they'll keep sending you a letter and then letters and 10,000 rand, then it will, will become 5,000 rand and uh, then it will become 10,000 rand without you noticing. And then later on they sue you again. So I always say, even if it's a small amount of money, if you know you owe them, just pay them and get out of trouble. And the issue uh, uh, regarding the, that interest there of 95% and 5% uh, is uh, uh, it's also being dealt with in your manual there. I'll explain it to you uh, later on when we'll be doing, uh, we'll be on page 84, but let's not go there for now. So for now is that you will then receive that performer cost from your, from your client. And when you receive that performer cost from the purchaser, remember it is still client's money and you have not registered the property, and for that reason, you will still receive that money in your trust account, and you will receive that money on behalf of the purchaser. That is why you will credit the purchaser's trust ledger account with that amount of money. You will credit the purchaser's trust ledger account with the performer cost that you have received from, uh, from the purchaser, which will be uh, what you call your transfer duty. And while you are doing that, at some instances, you will receive a notice from um, the receiver of revenue 
where they say to you that you need to come and pay a certain amount of the transfer duty. And again, remember I said to you the other day that when you make a payment on behalf of your client, payments are made from the credit side of your trust cash book. In other words, you are going to credit your trust cash book with whatever that you will be paying and then you then come back and then you debit the client on whose behalf you are making that payment in as far as the transfer duty is concerned. Some people or some student asked me before to say, is the transfer duty payable from the trust or from the business? And I say, always say to them, when you pay the transfer duty, the question is on whose behalf are you paying that transfer duty? If you are paying the transfer duty on behalf of your client, now the question is where do you record your client's money? And the answer is in your trust cash book or in your trust account. And if that is the case, that means you need to pay from the trust. I always say you never pay any disbursement uh, on behalf of your client from your business account unless is the last resort. You can only pay on behalf of your client from your business account unless it's a last resort. What do I mean by being a last resort? Let's say you want to pay disbursement on behalf of your client and the client has not yet put you in possession of enough deposit but you need to pay that disbursement today. If that is the case, then you can pay from your own business account and make the purchase uh, a business data. And I'll show you how you record that transaction just now. So you can pay from your business account. But in general, disbursements are paid from your trust account if you are paying those disbursements on behalf of your clients. Unless if you are paying a business transaction like your salaries. If you are paying your salaries, obviously salaries are not a trust transaction, it's a business transaction, in which case then you will have to pay those salaries from your business account. You will pay those salaries from the business account. When you want to pay for your business finishers, you will pay for business finishers from your business account because those are not trust transactions. Anything that you pay, you buy on behalf of your business, for, your, for the operation of your business. All the operational equipments or the operational expenses that you pay on behalf of your business will be paid from your business account. Please remember that. I don't want to see when we get your answer sheet there, when we say you pay the salaries and we found that you have paid the salaries from your trust account, that's not going to sit well with the Legal Practice Council. So you need to pay from your business account. It's important, guys, to make sure that your books are in order. I always tell uh, my colleagues like yourself to say, never ever love at somebody who is being struck from the role. I can tell you, many of our guys that have been struck from the role, it's not because they were uh, negligent, uh, of great negligence in that they just let things go wrong in a while watching them or they, they have mis misappropriated funds. So it's things, sometimes it's things that they just ignore them because they thought they are smaller thing and then they can take care of those things earlier. Sometimes you just get struck uh, <clears throat> for your books not being in order, not because you have misappropriated any funds. All the monies are still sitting in your trust account. No cent is missing. But because your books are in a shamble, your books are not in order, the Legal Practice Council can come and say, no, we can't take a risk with you. You are of higher risk. And for that reason, we are taking away the Fidelity Fund Certificate from you. And if we take the Fidelity Fund Certificate away from you, therefore, you no longer have the power to operate the trust account. And what does that mean? It means we as the Legal Practice Council are also going to take charge of your trust account. We are going to run it for you. You are no longer going to have anything to do with that trust account and they will pay all your trust creditors whatever that is uh, they are entitled to. 
so they will pay that. And if there is any shortage, remember, it is still your responsibility, despite the fact that they have taken that account away from you. So it will still be your responsibility to make good of that trust account. Okay, so it's very, very important. And remember what I said the other day, it's still going to apply here. Your trust cash flow can never reflect a, 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 a credit balance. In other words, you can never have more recorded on the credit side than what you will normally have recorded on the debit side of your uh, of your trust cash book. So your trust cash book must always have a debit balance. Your trust cash book must always have a positive balance. That is the rule. Never ever forget that. It's very, very important. Your client's trust ledger account must never reflect a negative balance. Your trust ledger account must never reflect a debit balance. So if it reflects a debit balance, remember you need to go and get money from that uh, from your business account to cover whatever deficit that you'll have had in your trust account and then the investigation you will do that later and remember what is important pay that money from your business account into the trust and then immediately also notify the legal practice council of what happens and what steps have you taken to take care of that particular deficit you need to report it if you don't report it, they are going to see it during the submission of the audited records. And if they see it at that stage, you will have difficulties in explaining better if you report yourself than them coming and asking you questions. So please remember that. Now you will see there on page, page 84, I'm not sure if it's page 84 for all of you. And then at, it said bulletin number three, or I'll say paragraph number three that say, step that should be followed. Or steps to you later when we are doing a practical exercise. If I start them now, uh, most of you will get very, very confused and you will not even understand what uh, I will be doing there. Now, what is very important, again, there on page 87, accounting statement to clients. People, please, make sure you account to clients in whatever that you do for them. If you are working on your client's matter, account to your clients. Even if you give them a monthly statement or you give them statement wherever, whatever type of an arrangement that you would have had with your client, but make sure that you account to client. Do not just transfer your fees and pay disbursement without letting the client how much your fees are, what disbursement are you paying, because that can come back to haunt you later. The client will go to the legal practice council and say, I gave this person 200,000 rands to work on my file. To date, I've never received an accounting statement, and it tells me that my file is closed. And if it is found that you have not accounted to your client, please remember again, it's an offense with the legal practice council. And accounting is very simple. It's not something that you need to worry about. You just say to your client, you gave me 100,000 rands, I charge you fees of 80,000 rand, I pay disbursement, sorry, I pay disbursement of 10,000 rand, and this is 10,000 rand, it's your change. That's all you do. So you do not want to find yourself in trouble because you fail to do just very simple uh, uh, things that you could have done if you had paid attention to details. Do an accounting statement. Do not just leave that with your bookkeeper. You must also look at those accounting statements yourself because that's where, again, if you don't check your, your, your books, that's where you are going to lose money because then uh, fictitious... Uh, uh, ...accounting statement 
and then somebody will be taking that money into their own personal account and at the end of the day uh, you have lost millions to some individual and then which again millions you need to pay from your own business account that's why we say you need to always take charge you need to always check your books is everything in order what is it that i suspect is not right look at those things and try to fix them in time while i was uh, practicing uh, as an attorney one of my mentor uh, an attorney who was my my principal then uh, who has unfortunately left us uh, last week may his soul rest in peace through corona he always says to me when you practice and you you run your own business with what a bookkeeper you need to be very careful you you need to guard your bookkeeper make sure that your bookkeeper take leave when leave is due to them never pay them off not to go on leave make sure they go on leave and he says to me most of the people that will come to work even when they are sick most of the time are bookkeeper and he says to me that there's a reason why they are doing that most of the time this bookkeeper is transferring money on a daily basis and he or she knows that if she goes on leave somebody comes and sit there on their table they are going to see what they are doing so that's why they don't take a leave so if you see your bookkeeper refusing to take leave you must suspect that something is not right start checking start going through your books see if all is well because if you don't do that by the time you open your eyes a lot of money will have been where will have went through your trust account and you will find yourself in serious trouble because remember if you ask around many 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 bookkeepers in law firms have stolen uh, practitioners money many bookkeepers i'm not saying bookkeepers are like that but i'm saying many of them some law firm have closed because bookkeepers transfer the money unlawfully and transfer it to themselves and their friends and everybody i've had one of those cases about a few weeks ago where the bookkeeper was transferring money to almost everybody in her family trying to hide the traces of that money and when the attorney uh, check over three million went out of their trust account and was transferred by this bookkeeper who was coming to work on a daily basis and remember if that happens the legal practice council still want answers from you as the legal as, as a practitioner as a person in charge of that particular trust account so you need to be very very careful please check your uh, check your books you come from very far to be where you are today and you are not going to lose your license because you fail to do uh, some checks are very small checkups that you had to do to guard your books now if you look at that on uh, page 87 there at paragraph number five there is a practical exercise there it says you are appointed a convincer in an agreement of purchase or sale of immovable property by seller to purchaser you drafted the agreement of sale on the instruction of your client seller the agreement made provision for the purchase price of 750,000 rand to be paid by purchaser by way of a deposit of 100,000 rand and the balance to be paid on registration of transfer the agreement provides for the purchaser to pay all costs all of the registration of transfer the following are the details so what you see or what you hear from that is that the the you are basically uh, going to deal with the registration of a property where the property is being sold for 750,000 rents and for that 750,000 the purchaser will pay the deposit of 100,000 rents 
and uh, the balance will be paid upon registration of transfer and that the purchaser is the one liable for paying all costs of transfer and the following are the details. On the 1st of June, the estate agent sent you a pro forma account in respect of commission of 15,000 rand payable when due in law. Now remember, very important, I indicated to you that when due in law simply means upon registration of the property. In other words, that account of an estate agent is not due on the 1st of June. On the 1st of June, you are not going to pay the estate agent. Just take that account, keep it in your file, wait for the transfer to be registered, and then you can pay the estate agent their 15,000 rents. On the 3rd of June, purchaser pays you the deposit of 100,000 rand by check. And then that is transaction number one and two. Please remember that the checks have been phased out, but what I'm going to do is that I'm going to do this statement with you as it is uh, on the basis that it's a check. And then later on, I do the ones on the, that don't deal with the check so that you are able to move from stage where you are working with checks to where you are no longer working with checks so that you can see how you transit between uh, uh, the check and the EFT, which is now what is being used because we no longer uh, work on the checks. But I'll show you how it's happened. And then they say one to two. That means transaction number one to transaction number two. Now let's look at it. What is transaction number one? When you receive this money from the purchaser, number one is you are going to debit your trust cash book. That is number one. And then number two is that as soon as you debit your trust, uh, trust cash book, you ask yourself, whose money is this? This is the purchaser's money, and therefore you are going to open a T account for the purchaser, and then you credit the purchaser's trust ledger account with that amount of 100,000 rand, and that will be transaction number two. The purchaser request. Okay. Daniel, which question are we? Where are we? And we are on page 88 of the manual. Page 88 of the manual. That is that practical exercise. That is paragraph uh, paragraph number five, practical exercise. Okay. Advocate, can you deal with it? Hello? Can you please repeat transaction number one, check number one? Oh, that, that check? Yes. Okay. The purchaser pays you the deposit of 100,000 by check. And I am saying you are receiving a check from the purchaser. And when you receive this check from the purchaser, remember the purchaser now is your client. That tells you that this is client's money. And if the, this check of 100,000 rand is client's money, it tells you that this is trust money. Because all your client, the money that you receive from your client must be received in your trust account which means you must debit your trust cash book and that means transaction number one will be debiting that check in your trust cash book and then now then the next question will be what is transaction number two because they say one to two and number two is you ask yourself whose money is this from whom am, did i receive this money you received it from the purchaser therefore you are going to credit the purchaser's trust ledger account. You are going to open a T account for the purchaser and credit that 100,000 rand, and that will be your transaction number two. And then purchaser requires you to invest the monies in an interest-bearing account for a benefit and invest the money with APSA. That's transaction number three and four, which I'll also explain in detail when we record it there. But what is very important is that when you invest this money, you are going to take this money out of your cash book and pay it to the investment account. And taking money out of your cash book means making payment out of your cash book. And when you make a payment out of your cash book, that means you are going to credit your trust cash book with that 100,000 rands 
and you open a T account for the investment. And in that T account, you are going to debit that T account. On the fourth, you submit your performance statement to purchaser for the cost of transfer of 40,000 rand, including 30,000 rand for the transfer duty. Now remember, on the fourth, you are only submitting a statement. You are only submitting a statement. You are not receiving any money. You are not making any payment. It's just a statement that you are receiving. Therefore, on the 4th of June, you are not recording any transaction. 6th of June, you receive a bank guarantee from Standard Bank for 650000 Remember, the, the property was selling for 750. The purchaser pays a deposit of 100,000 and that means you need 650. Now you receive a bank guarantee. Now remember again, a bank guarantee that you are receiving on the 6th is not money. It's just a guarantee from the bank to say, we guarantee you that the bond has been approved in favor of the purchaser. Therefore, proceed with the registration. As soon as the property is registered, let us know we will pay the 650000 rands. We will pay that amount of money to you. So you are not recording anything on the 6th of June. So the 650000 is a promissory note. Yes. Yes. Now, on the 7th of June, purchaser pays with a performer cost of 40000 by check, and that transaction number 5 to 6. Now, you are receiving 40,000 rand check from the purchaser. And that tells you again that this is client's money. Because it's client's money, you are going to receive it again on the debit side of your trust cash book. And you say, whose money is this? From whom am I receiving this money? You are receiving the purchaser's money. On that ledger account that you have opened for the purchaser, where you, are, you have received the 100,000 rand, you are also going to receive the 40,000 rand by crediting that ledger account. Okay. Now, on number, on the eight, on the eight, you pay the transfer duty. That is seven and eight. Now, firstly, how much is the transfer duty? How much is the transfer duty that we need to pay? 30,000. 30, correct. The transfer duty is 30,000 and you'll see it there on the 4th of June. On the 4th of June there, you'll see the transfer duty is 40,000, so 30,000 rands. That's what you are paying there on the 8th of June. Now, I want you to look at this. You receive the cost by means of a check on the 7th. And then the following day, you pay the transfer duty. Now the question is, from which account are you going to pay the transfer duty? From trust account. From trust account. Which money are you going to use to pay the transfer duty? Client's money. How much? From which, from which figure? 40,000. 100,000. From the 100,000 or from the 40,000 rands. Now, this is very, very important to remember. The deposit that you receive for the purpose of paying for the property, like the 100,000 rands, the, the deposit that you receive for the purpose of paying the purchase property, you do not use that deposit to pay any disbursement of whatever nature. You don't use that deposit to pay disbursement. It doesn't matter. Never use the deposit for the purchase of the property to pay the disbursement. In other words, you cannot use that 100,000 to pay disbursement. In any way, that 100,000 is no longer in your trust is in the investment account. 
but even if it was there, you will not use it to pay disbursement. And that leaves you with one figure, which is 40,000, isn't so? Yeah. Correct. Can you pay the 30,000 from the 40,000? You well, can. Check. Yeah, hasn't cleared has it correct the check has not cleared remember when you get into the bank there on that uh, uh what do you call it next to the uh, to the case here there they have written something like the check is subject to a 10 days clearance period remember that yes yes now before this check is cleared before the 10 days lapses you will not use this check to pay any disbursement of whatever nature, including your fee. You cannot use that check to pay anything before the 10 days lapses. Before the 10 days lapses, we assume that there are no funds. Now, that leaves you with a zero balance in your trust. But you need to pay this transfer duty today. Now the question yeah, is, which account are you going to pay? Business account. Use the business account. Correct. You are going to pay it from your own business account, from your own business cash book. In other words, you are going to credit your business cash book. Remember, from the business cash book you pay on the credit side. You are going to credit your business cash book, and then you say, on whose behalf am I paying this? at 30,000 and is on behalf of the purchaser and therefore it means the purchaser now is going to owe you the 30,000 that you are paying on his or her behalf and therefore after debit after crediting your business cash book whose account are you going to debit and which account the purchase uh, ledger which ledger trust ledger Trust? No. Zimbini, correct. Nguni, correct. Shelly, correct. You will credit your business cash book and then you will debit the purchaser's business ledger account. Not the trust, but the business account. Because why do you debit his business account? because he must owe you that money. He owes you that money, he must pay it later. And whatever the client owes you, you record that in their business ledger account. You cannot record what the client owes you in their trust ledger account. As soon as you record it in their trust ledger account, you will not be able to get it back. So whatever the client owes you must be recorded against their business ledger account. That is why in this case, because this purchaser is going to owe you 30 tanan. You will credit your business cash book and then you debit the purchaser's business ledger account. Okay. That is your on the 8th. And then on the 10th, the check for 40 tanan is returned by the bank marked refer to drawer. That's an RD check, transaction number 9 and 10. Now, this is an RD check, isn't so? Remember that check of 40,000 that we received from client, from the purchaser. What did we do with that check? We debited our trust cash book and credited the purchaser, isn't so? Yes. Now, now the check has been returned. When the check is returned, what do you do? Which account do you check reverse. and which account do you credit? You credit the, the purchaser. You credit? The trust cash book. The business account. Yeah, the person is trust. The trust cash book. The trust cash book. Mm -hmm. And your debit who? The purchaser. The, debit, the, the purchaser. The purchaser's yes. ledger. Correct. That's exactly what you do. Because what happens initially is that you receive that check on the debit and you credited the purchaser with the same. Uh, amount now suddenly they tell you that that check now is invalid now it's not going to be paid then you must record the direct opposite of what you recorded when you initially received the check 
When you initially receive the check, you debited your trust cash book. Now you must credit your cash book. You credited the client's trust. Now you must debit the client's trust. That's how you do. Just a direct opposite of what you did with that check when you initially received it. Okay. Now, the 11. Sorry, I should get yes. a question. Yes. Um, that initial uh, amount of 100,000 rand that was invested. Yes. You pay, you pay that out of your trust book, um, trust cash book into the investment account. Yes. Do you then also um, debit the purchases account? Okay. Yes, that's very, that's very important because again, I've seen many students uh, doing it wrong there. When you invest the money, you simply credit your trust cash book and then you, you debit the investment account. You don't do anything on your client's trust ledger account. Your client's trust ledger account, you must leave it with that credit as it is. Why you leave it with that credit is that even when this money is invested wherever it is, remember, you as a legal practitioner, you are still in charge of that money on behalf of your client. That is why you must leave the client's trust ledger account with a credit that shows that you still owe the clients that money. Despite the fact that you have invested it, you take responsibility for that investment, you still account to your client. That's why you don't touch the client's trust ledger account when you invest. Simply credit your trust cash book and then debit your investment account. Please remember that. Do not touch your client's trust ledger account during the investment process. Just take money out of your trust cash book straight into the investment account and then you are done with the investment. Okay. Now, we are on the, on the 11. The purchaser pays you 40,000 rand in cash and that is transaction number 11 to 14. Now the question is, how are you going to deal with that transaction? How are you going to record that transaction? You debit the trust uh, cash book. Without much. <coughs> debit the trust cash book with how much? Oh, with 40,000. 40,000 then. And no. credit the purchaser's uh, ledger account, trust ledger account with the same amount. Mm -hmm. No. <laughs> We don't do that. We don't record it like that. Uh, any other uh, guess? Um, I it would have Do you receive it in the business cash account? You receive in the business account, the business uh, cash book. Business cash, cash book. And how do you receive it in the business cash book? You'd have to, because you the debit, business cash book you, would, be, um, business you would debit it because it's an asset. You receive and you pay monies out of your business cash book. Officially correct, but not and completely correct. You will <laughs> receive the 30,000 rands in your business cash book and 10,000 rands in the trust uh, cash book. That's correct. That is correct. If, if you've got a transaction of this nature, what happens is that if you, if you have already paid a disbursement like your transfer duty on behalf of your client, in this case, we have already paid an amount of 30 rand on behalf of the purchaser. <laughs> if the purchaser later pays you in cash, you must take the amount equivalent to what you have already paid for him or her mm. directly in business and the balance in trust. In this case, we have already paid 30,000 transfer duty on his behalf. He owes us 
30,000 rands. Therefore, we must receive 30,000 directly in business by debiting our business cash book, and then we credit the purchaser's business ledger account 30,000 rands. We have paid ourselves before we even receive that money in trust. And then you say, after receiving my payments directly in business of 30,000, how much is the balance? 10,000. 10,000. And this 10,000 belongs to the purchaser. And therefore, it tells you it is client's money. That's why you are going to receive 10,000 rands in the trust account or in your trust cash book by debiting your trust cash book and then you credit the purchaser's trust ledger account with the same 10,000 rand. So that's how you deal with that payment as soon as you receive it in that fashion. Firstly, receive what the client owes you directly in business by debiting your business cash book and then you credit the client's business ledger account the balance you receive in trust by debiting your trust cash book and then crediting uh, the clients of the purchaser's trust ledger account with 10,000 rents. Advocate, um, okay. um, just moving forward, it, basically just to clear out any confusion, whenever we do something regarding our purchaser in the business, like for this example where we receive this 30,000, whenever we obviously do something in the business cash book, and if it has a relevant double entry in the um, business ledger, it's always going to be that way. Whenever we deal with the trust purchaser, then we'll deal with trust cash book, trust ledger, if it is applicable. Uh, okay, can you repeat that again? You just got cut uh, while you were speaking there. Sorry, advocate. My question is basically anytime we're dealing with the trust cash book, there yes. would be a double entry like in terms of the trust purchaser and obviously the same for the business um, cash book and business purchaser. Yes, yes. Okay, as a general like rule. Yes, yes. Uh, yes, that you will definitely have to record that double that double entry. You'll see we deputed the uh, the trust cash book, we created the client's trust ledger, we debited our business cash book, we credited the client's business ledger account. So it will always be a double entry. Uh, 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 as a rule, make sure that every time you record that transaction, at least more than once. Okay, thank you so much, Advocate. That really makes sense because it, it makes sense in my head now. Thank you. Okay, no problem. Okay. Yes. Um, would it have been a different case if it, the money was not in cash? Yes, uh, yes, it would have been a, a different case. If, for instance, let's say uh, on the 11th there, they say the purchaser gives you another check of 40,000 rands. If that was that case, they say he gives you another check of 40,000 rands. That check of 40,000 rand, you will have had to receive all of it in your trust cash book and then credit the purchaser's trust ledger account if it's, if it's a check. But if it's cash, can, can, can then divide it. But if it's not cash, it's a check, and then you receive all of it in your, uh, in your trust cash book and then you credit the client's trust ledger account. And how would you have gone about... Um retrieving your 30,000 that you used from your business account. You leave it, you leave the account as it is. Later on, I'll show you how you transfer that money so that it comes back into your business. I'll show that to you later on. But for okay. now, you leave it as it is. So on on June 11th, um, we recorded three transactions. Four transactions, actually. Four. You debited your business cash book with 30,000, you yes. created the purchase as business ledger, 30,000 rand. That's two transactions. Okay. And then you debited your trust cash book, 10,000 rands. And then you credited the purchase of trust ledger account, 10,000 rands. Okay. Thank yeah. You. Okay. <clears throat> Advocate? Yes. Can uh, so you I'm please a... repeat that? What I'm saying is, when you receive this 40,000 rands, because it is in cash, you must receive what the client owes you in business, directly in business, and the balance you must receive in the trust. Now, at this stage, 
We know that the purchaser owes us 30,000 rands. So the 30,000 rand we are going to receive it directly in business by debiting our business cash book, and then we credit the purchaser's business uh, ledger account with uh, the same amount of 30,000 rands. You debit the business cash book. In other words, you are receiving 30,000 rand directly in business, and then you credit the purchaser business ledger account. Now you see, after credit the purchaser's business ledger account, you will see the purchaser now doesn't owe you that they are run in business because he has, he has paid it to you. Now, after you receive the 30 thousand rand directly in business, now there is a balance of 10 thousand rand from that 40 thousand rand. And we are saying the 10 thousand rand is client's money. Yes. And how do you deal with client's money? Client's money must be received in your trust by debiting your trust cash book, and then you say, whose money is this 10,000 rand? It is the purchaser's money. And therefore, you go and create the purchaser's trust ledger account with the 10,000 rands after debiting your trust cash book with the same 10,000 rands. Advocate, are you yes. saying that I... I debit my business account from that 40,000 and I take 30,000 rand into my business account. I debit it there. And then I also credit the the client's trust account with 30,000 rand. Not a business account, not trust. No, advocate, you are saying that from that 40,000 rand. Yes. I debit the business account with 30,000 rand. Well, your business cash book, yes. Yes. And then I continue to to credit the client's trust account. With how much? With 30,000 rand. No, that's not what I'm saying. And then I debit no. 10,000 rand. To before, before, you proceed, that's, before you proceed, that's not what I said. <clears throat> I, I didn't hear I you. Said, I said you debit your, your business cash book with 30,000 rand. And then you credit the purchaser's business ledger, not trust ledger. You credit the purchaser's business ledger with 30,000 rands. Okay. And then you debit your trust cash book with the balance, which is 10,000 rands. And then you credit the purchaser's trust ledger account with 10,000 rands. I see. Okay. Okay. Now, let's look on the on the. But we'll do it together just now. On when we when we do this exercise together. On the twentieth, they say the transfer is registered. You receive interest of ten thousand rand from APSA. Remember, at APSA, that is where we have uh, invested. And they say transaction number fifteen to eighteen. I'll, I'll discuss those transactions with you now. Now, you debit the purchaser a further fee of 350 rand for the investment you account to purchaser and seller. Make all the entries in your books of prime entry and ledgers. No provision need be made for that. Prepare accounting statement to both purchaser and seller. In the answer in paragraph 6, all the transaction to date of registration including the withdrawing of the investment, including interest thereon, on the day of registration are numbered from 1 to 14. The remaining unnumbered entries follow um, steps set out in paragraph 3. Remember in paragraph 3, those are those steps that I said to you. I don't want to explain them to you. I'll explain them to you nicely when we deal with that uh, practical exercise so that they become more clear of, uh, for you. Now, the one thing that I forgot again, on that uh, document, on the on the link that you were sent, there were three attachments. Now, one of the attachment is those convincing steps. You see there are eight steps. The one-page document, that has got eight steps. One, two, if you've got that document, 
you need to put it on next to you. But I'll go through that, that document when I will be going to go through those steps on paragraph three. When I go through those steps on paragraph three, that's when I'll be going through that one page document because I tried to make everything as easy as possible on that one page document. In other words, I dealt with all those steps at paragraph three in that one page document. You'll see in that one page document, I tell you exactly what do you deal with at what stage and that which you are dealing with, which account you debit, which account you credit. If there's a journal that you need to open, what journal do you need to open? Now, I want us to go back to that exercise there on page, starting from page 89 to 